Well, the key point, I issue is, is power. Uh, you, can't, you can't commit an antitrust offense unless you're a vice president who's dealing with, with competitors. Uh, so you've got to have the, the standing and the ability uh, to engage in the crime. I can't do insider trading, for example, because I got any, I'm not inside and I don't trade. Uh, but if you're, if you're a broker or if you're an executive vice president who gets the information beforehand, and can uh, tell your friends about it or sell your stock before the, uh, the information becomes public. So the, the, the position of the person is absolutely crucial to, the, uh, uh, to carrying on white collar crime effectively or to doing it at all. You know, in the Martha Stewart case, for example, uh, uh, you know, she was very cozy with, with the broker. Somebody calls her up and tells her that the, uh, uh, that the broker is unloading his stock and she immediately unloads her. And the irony there was she'd been on the stock exchange. You know, she knew that that, w that was an illegal act. The money was inconsequential to her. Uh, you know, to make the slightest bit of difference as a fraction of, uh, of her income. And, of course, the third irony of the case is that uh, they prosecuted for perjury, not for insider trading. And if she kept her mouth shut, uh, she never would have gone to prison. It's very difficult to convict white-collar offenders because you've got to prove, you've got to prove intent, mens rea, and that is very, very complicated. You know, to follow up on the insider trading thing, all you need to say is, I really intended to unload that stock on Tuesday, and it just is a terrible coincidence that that's two days before the news became official that they've, they're going to take a big hit. And how do you prove that wasn't true? And of course, in Miss Stewart's case, uh, she proved it through her own mouth. There's clearly a sense of entitlement. Uh, the obnoxious and obscene salaries that uh, are being paid now on Wall Street is a function of the fact that uh, the guy at the next company is making a uh, million dollars more than you're making, and he's got a bigger yacht, and you've got a, you know two more houses than you do. Uh, there's a very uh, slightly vulgar saying by Francis Bacon, who was a 16th century philosopher. He says, the higher you climb, the more your ass shows. The entitlement issue is interesting. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's quite accurate as a perception. You know, you can't take a $28 million bonus five years in a row without feeling that, and it's coming out of, of course, stockholder uh, uh, dividends or stockholder earnings without somehow feeling that a, you, you've either earned it or you're entitled to it. You know, and the, the irony in, in the recent meltdown, of course, is your company has lost, you know, two two billion dollars, and you're getting a two hundred sixty thousand uh, dollar a bonus. And then you ask the ask the board of directors, how how did that happen? They say, well, we've got to pay them that much in order to get the best and the brightest. But the question is, how 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 bright you need to be to lose two hundred sixty million dollars or two billion dollars? You know, even I can manage to do that, probably. One of the ironies in white collar crime is company A is cheating like hell, and they show a, a, a profit, let's say, of about uh, two hundred eighty, three hundred thousand dollars or billion dollars. Uh, then company B's board of directors says, "How come, you know, we're not?" making that kind of money. So the, the pre CEO of company B finds himself in a very awkward position. Uh, a is cheating. His, his board of directors is coming down on him for not doing as well. And the incentive to cheat is, is quite intense. And, and, you know, in order to... And the other thing, of course, is these guys moving up. The mobility is, is very, very uh, strong so that they, they, are, they concentrate on short-term profits. And Wall Street demands short-term profits. You know, so you, you say, well, in 10 years, uh, this thing is going to pay off. That's, that's too long. You know, the people who buy stock want, you know, Wall Street sets, uh, this is how much they're going to earn. They've got to make that, uh, you know, that earning figure that Wall Street has pre-established. You know, in the, the Saudi case, uh, uh, you know, he said, whatever you do, you know, fudge the books in order to uh, earn whatever Wall Street says our figure is for this year. So they start out with that figure and then fudge the books to get there. That's not an uncommon philosophy in American society. You only win when the other guy loses. It's not very healthy.
and often it causes you a lot of personal anguish, but uh, it does exist. There's no question about it. The culture doesn't ask where the money comes from. The culture asks, do you have it? And that's a, that's a devastating axiom within American society. Everybody has problems. They solve them in different ways. Uh, you know, I, I need uh, $15,000 because I've had a, a, some problems with my house. Uh, do I get a second job? Do I borrow it from my uncle? Uh, do I go out and, uh, and, and hold up a bank? And the question is, what differentiates the people who opt for each of, the, you know, for each of these different alternative ways of resolving a problem? Or I simply declare bankruptcy. You know, the, the pressure to solve the problem is not equivalent, doesn't have an equivalent effect on, on every person. Each one of them responds in a different way to, to, the, to the situation. Okay, let's, let's take an illustration of, of the difficulty that we're confronted that we're confronted with. You've got a hundred people and you're trying to determine which ones are going to become white collar criminals. Uh, I, I, will, I will bet any amount of money that you're not going to do very well with any of the existing theories. One of the severe problems is that people tend to commit white collar crime after they become involved in situations not when they're in college graduates or when they're in their first five years of their job. It's after certain other circumstances arise, and it often has very little to do with their personalities, but has a great deal to do with the circumstances in which they find themselves. So any theory, and I, I can't stress this too much, any theory to be valid has to be predictive. And you've got to be able to say, you know, you take rational choice, all right, now you've got rational choice, you've got 100 people, tell me how you, who's going to be a white collar criminal. It's not going to help you much. You know, you can't go anywhere with the theory, uh, in a sense. You can ask them, uh, but as I say, you know, they do studies of business school graduates. That's not going to get you very far. There's a lovely say, statement uh, in which somebody, a Nobel laureate, said, if, if uh, at atomic particles could think, physics would be a very complicated subject. Well, the you know it isn't now. You can you can get rules of physics, but people do think, and people do respond, and they respond very differently to different kinds of circumstances. And it is a very very complex, and inordinately difficult, uh, predictive task to unravel. You know you can do it retroactively, but the trick is to do it pro you do it forward looking. You know, take those hundred people and tell me who's going to be a white. You know, take the hundred graduates from from the MBA program. Who's going to be a white collar criminal? I don't know anybody who's capable of even coming close to doing that. Which doesn't mean it's hopeless, but it means that that a heck of a lot more very good work is going to have to be done before that scenario is going to be able to be pinned down. You know, with some sort of uh, some sort of exactitude. The, the best study is Marshall Clenard's study uh, in which he interviewed, uh, went down to Arizona and interviewed retired middle managers uh, in corporations. And they, uh, the setting allowed him to get fairly honest answers. Overwhelmingly, uh, they said that the way the CEO and the upper management defined the culture of the corporation was absolutely essential to how they behave vis-a-vis -vis the law and how the company behaved vis-a-vis -vis the law. So uh, essentially, if, and as I, I said earlier, uh, uh, CEOs have a tendency to move a lot, and they're interested in short-term results because they're going to be gone in, in, in the long term. And so that the culture becomes, you know, it, it can be very crime-inducing. Now the other problem that we've got is you, you've got these corporate codes of conduct and it very much ties to, to uh, the culture of the corporation because in some corporations they get these very elaborate codes of conduct. No one pays any attention to them. You know, they, they think they wink at it. They think it's just window dressing. Uh, the GE case is a very good example. They, they, it was an antitrust violation. And they went right in and, you know, the, the vice presidents were all fixing prices. But one guy refused. 
He said, I signed that, that document. It was against my religion to sign it and uh, engage in antitrust, and I wouldn't do it. They didn't fire him. They uh, moved him to, <laughs> to another position. But they, but they kept him on. But what, the, the way the CEO indicates the things that are to be done really filters down through the ranks very, very thoroughly.